Well, without further ado, and he said he was going to introduce himself as he gives his talk, I'd like to introduce you to Tom Lynch. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, great to have such a good turnout here. I appreciate it. Uh, I can't help but think when I see so many friends and acquaintances and so on gathered together, I always have the same thought. I hope this isn't another intervention. <laughs> Anyhow, I added a couple slides. Some of you may have seen the presentation I did before on uh, Zoom. I added a couple more because of questions people had, sort of how I got into this line of business. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to explain that. Um, there's liable to be some questions, so I'm going to ask you to withhold those until I'm done. Uh, and then I'd be happy to answer questions and let you come up and play with this stuff. Mike stole my gag about the poison darts. Thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, but we can get started. And um, as you can see, this particular frame, time frame is 1977. A uh, little background, there was, I had been working in Indonesia for a while then. There were these massive earthquakes in what then was called Irian Jaya, which is New Guinea, the Indonesian side of New Guinea. Uh, the eastern side in those days was Australian. The western side was Indonesian. It is still Indonesian. The other side now is its own country, Papua New Guinea. Uh, so uh, this was in response to those earthquakes, and um, I think they might be eye-opening. Uh, how did I get into the line of business? Well, <laughs> fairly obvious. Um, I quit college because by that point I knew everything. Uh, so uh, I fooled the uh, draft board by letting me join the Army for four years instead of just getting drafted for two years. Um, this, is, this is me and my hot rod. I was uh, stationed in the Central Highlands in Vietnam. And um, as you can see, it was fairly challenging flying. This, believe it or not, th this doesn't work. Over on the left-hand side, you see sandbags. That was a helipad. Um, I was flying in the mountains, and it was very challenging flying, but it, it actually prepared me well for what was to come. Uh, the good part was there was fireworks at night. <laughs> it's almost like Disneyland. Uh, and uh, that's me trying to figure out how to get out of this. Uh, a lot of you may or may not be aware of Indonesia. I did not know where it was when I first took the job to go there. Uh, it turns out it's here. It's um, in the bottom, you see Australia. Top left is Southeast Asia, is Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, going down through Malaysia, down to Singapore, right at the tip of a peninsula there. I wish I had a pointer, sorry. Um, all those other islands are Indonesia. Indonesia is comprised of 15, over 15,000 islands. Um, it used to be called the Dutch East Indies. Some of you probably have heard of that. Uh, it was also called, parts of it were called the Spice Islands. You probably know of those. Uh, some of these waters are where Captain Bly sailed through after the mutiny. Um, it's a place uh, buried in tradition and history and stuff. And it was so foreign to me that I took pains to try and learn about it. Indonesia doesn't mean anything to you, but these names probably do. Borneo, New Guinea, Sumatra, Java, Bali, um, Sulawesi, maybe not so much. Um, anyhow, that is what comprises Indonesia. Uh, it's 2,000 miles from end to end, and it is the fourth most populous country in the world, the most populous Muslim country in the world. There's other religions there, but Muslims predominate that they tend to. There's some Christian uh, groups in Sumatra and also in Sulawesi. Bali is Hindu. Some of you have probably been there. That's a real enchanted place. Um, anyhow, I lived in that neighborhood for about six years. 
uh, four years on this stint, and then I came back again with my wife uh, in the mid-80s, and we were back there again living in Singapore. But uh, it's an extremely exciting place. It's beautiful. Um, it's, it's breathtakingly beautiful, actually. Uh, so anyhow, I undertook this job to go there, not reali realizing I was going back to Southeast Asia after I had escaped my first trip there. Um, but I was happy that I did. <laughs> this is the north coast of New Guinea. Uh, this is around a city called Jayapura, which in the old days used to be called Hollandia. Because Indonesia is the Dutch East Indies, a lot of their history revolves around uh, when the Dutch were in charge. They got, they were asked to leave in uh, 1945 but there's a lot of history there. Um, so Hollandia then became Jayapura, and that's here. Believe it or not, this beach, as pretty as it is, this was the site of a, uh, uh, of a beach assault during World War II. A lot of the war was fought here. In fact, Jayapura was uh, MacArthur's headquarters uh, before he started his trips up through the Philippines and stuff. So there's a lot of history there. Um, all over the mountains and uh, there's crash planes and stuff. There's boats sunk in the bays. Um, it's everywhere. And it's not a large population, so it, it sort of overtakes everything. I, mean, I, I, don't, I can't think of any restaurant I went to in Jayapura that the silverware didn't say USN on it, <laughs> which is US Navy which they had, uh, you know, commandeered from uh, sunken boats and stuff like that. Um, that was the bay outside of Jayapura, very pretty. Um, Jayapura was the center for the missionary efforts around there. Uh, they were really the only uh, expatriates you could find around that area. There was some exploitation going on, and by that I mean uh, exploration, uh, mining, and stuff like that. But for the most part, the people were not used to seeing white folks. Um, so it was always, you know, you could walk into a place and the music would stop and you felt like Clint Eastwood walking into some bar in, you know, Wyoming or something. But um, anyhow, uh, among some of the other features there, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, it's almost on the equator. Well, the equator runs through here. But there's a full-time glacier with snow on it year-round. Um, it's called Karsten's Pyramid. It's above 16,000 feet. Unfortunately, glaciers don't like to live on the equator. Um, and these days, like most other glaciers, they're starting to recede. But uh, it's pretty stunning to be flying along out, you know, in the jungle and stuff and look over and see the sun glistening off the snow, you know. Uh, that's just clouds spilling over a, a mountain. It's a huge, huge place, and I never thought that I would see a place quite as remote and uninhabited as here. Um, it was literally terra inc. Can you hear me? Okay. Terra incognita. This is one of the maps. Some of you guys that may be pilots or whatever, I have a whack chart over here, which is a World Aeronautical chart, and you can see uh, there's just large swaths of white that say terrain data incomplete, relief data incomplete. That means there might be a mountain here. We're not guaranteeing it. It could be 12,500 feet. Maybe it's flat. We're not sure. So you basically were dreaming up your own map the whole time you were there, uh, which was a little tricky, I'll admit. But um, uh, you got used to it. So in 1977, they had these massive earthquakes there. And by massive, I mean they were in the sevens, some of them eights. As it turns out, because of the terrain and the living conditions and stuff, 
there's no buildings to fall down or anything like that. The worst that could happen is your grass, you know, roof would fall on your head. However, here's the downside. A lot of the villages there, they built on top of mountains for defense and so on uh, to secure themselves. And um, this, if you look just to the left of center in the middle, that's a village. Um, you can see what happened during this earthquake. The entire mountain evaporated underneath them. They were saved. Not all the villages there were the same. Um, a lot of them washed down into the valleys and stuff like that. The casualties were enormous. And so um, I was called in to respond to it. Well, the fact is, <laughs> the poor people in Irian, they're pretty backward. They're literally Stone Age people, a lot of them. I mean, not everybody. But they were pretty much an embarrassment to uh, the people in Jakarta. The Javanese run the country, and they sort of feel that they're above everything. Uh, and they have some right to that. I mean, they, they make enormous revenues from oil and so on. The state-run company is called Pertamina. Um, but uh, they were embarrassed by these people that lived over on the fringe of their country. Indonesia actually has a satellite. Uh, it's called Palapa which means coconut. It should tell you a little something about the mindset in Indonesia. Uh, but so they felt they were right on the verge. They were maybe second world and stuff, and these people were a, a total embarrassment to them. So when this catastrophe happened, they just ignored it. Um, to toot our horn for a second, the only people that responded were the US Agency for International Development. They stepped in and took up a relief effort to get medical supplies, food, stuff like that to the people in the interior. And by interior, I mean these places in the mountains. It was right on the border between Papua and Irian Jaya. Um, very remote. They were just not used to any sort of civilization there. So um, I got hired. Uh, from a company, I was working for a company that was based in Jakarta at the time, uh, to go out there and fly supplies in to these people. Um, it was extremely challenging. That's another view, one of the other valleys. You can see that was all green at one point. And all those uh, trees and forests just washed down into the, into the valleys and stuff below. If you look, again, just to the left of center, that's actually an airstrip. <laughs> the, airstri the airstrips were very primitive there. I was happy I was in a helicopter because some of these missionary pilots used to go and fly into these places and there were washboards. They were like this when you landed or you landed uphill like on a ski ball thing and you stood on the brakes on top or some of them even had curves in them. So you had to be a pretty decent pilot to be able to navigate these things. Of course, they were missionary pilots, so God was their co-pilot. <laughs> yes, I went there. <laughs> All right. This is a fairly, eh, I wouldn't call this a typical village. This is a large village uh, in that area. Here's another one. I mean, some of them were so pretty. It was like a Bill Burrard uh, travelogue. Um, these guys were spared. You can see that's what those villages used to look like before the earthquake. These guys were not, un they were untouched by it. Because Indonesia is in an area called uh, the Ring of Fire, you've probably heard of, and it's, it's surrounded by volcanoes and earthquakes and horrible geological conditions. Where's Mike? Mike's a geologist, yeah. okay. Okay, there's a picture of an airstrip right there. So you can see it's a little bit, eh, it's a little bit rugged. Uh, they uh, they only flew single engine aircraft into these things, and that was to uh, that was to support the missionaries. The only people that were out there really were missionaries, and they were all either American or Canadian. 
those are the only guys that would undertake this challenge to go out there. And very wisely, they chose to go out there with usually two families so that they weren't feeling so alone and isolated and stuff. Um, and their job, you know, as missionaries are wont to do, it was all altruistic. They wanted to, they wanted to uh, get them to wear clothes. They trained them in the Bible uh, and stuff and uh, tried to look after their health and stuff like that. Uh, however, there were also um, the only other white guys around while I was there. So during the earthquake, they pulled all the missionaries out. They went up to Jayapur. So I was sort of by myself. There were two other German anthropologists about three valleys over. I used to go and visit and have coffee in the morning. And anthropologists and missionaries are this. <laughs> you know, The missionaries want to change things. The anthropologists say, leave them alone. Don't touch a thing. We want it just like it was. You know, So I understand both sides of that argument. Uh, but I'm sure that same argument is still going on today. These are the kind of uh, houses, the houses the, that the uh, locals lived in. Uh, they were round houses. They built them round so that spirits didn't get caught in the corners. Uh, last thing you want is an evil spirit stuck in the corner trying to get out. So they built them round so they could run around and run around. Um, I actually had occasion to stay in one of these houses one time. Um, I had an experience where um, <laughs> I, I was on a crew change and I had just gotten to where I was supposed to go. And the missionary there who, and th this is stranger than truth, he was married to my cousin. My cousin was there. And he asked me if I'd do him a favor and fly him across the valley. Uh, because he had to go, you know, check on something that he was doing over there. So I said, yeah, no problem. Um, I took him over there. I said, is there a place to land? Oh, yeah, there's a helipad. Well, um, it was a couple of logs that were, bit, you know, balanced on the end of a mountaintop. Um, I went and landed there. He jumped out with a couple of his pals, and they went off to do what they were doing. And I was sitting in the helicopter and shut it down, and... Uh, I said, well, I may as well get out and stretch, you know. So I stepped outside the aircraft and came to realize I was the only thing that was holding it on the pad. And the next thing I saw were the skids, the landing gear, going like this, <laughs> up past my face. Fortunately, helicopters have what are called tail stingers on them, which is a stinger in the back to keep you from bumping the tail rotor into the ground. It hung up on that. The cliff was about 1,500 feet. As it was sitting there like that, I was going, how are you going to explain this? <laughs> <laughs> and even, even more of a problem was the fact not only was I tilted like that over a precipice, but now my fuel cell is dripping fuel all over the exhaust, which is about 350 degrees. I'm saying, if I don't get that out of there, I'm blowing up. <laughs> I'm going to catch on fire. I got the guys to come back. We pushed it up. I was afraid there was structural damage, so uh, I took off to go back to where I was supposed to be, which is another missionary camp. And um, uh, as I said, there were no maps. I had just come back from a break. I really didn't know where I was, and it was the monsoon season. Uh, so the cloud and the fogs closed down over the tops of the mountains. All of a sudden, I'm in a Skinner box in the, um, in the mountains trying to find my way out. Uh, I was confused. Pilots are never lost. We're disoriented. Uh, I was disoriented. And I flew around until I was almost out of fuel. I mean, I had a fuel light come on, uh, which meant I had 15 minutes of fuel. Um, so I opted to land. An old, an old pilot saw is that the only time you have too much fuel is when you're on fire. Um, I didn't have any fuel left. I had to land. So I found a, a site, 
And I was a little concerned because I didn't remember landing there before. It was just an open area, cleared out. And I'll digress for a second. The people learned that if they had a flat area opened up, that some white guy would come in and land and discharge a bunch of food and, you know, I didn't have baby roos or anything like that, but it, uh, it was fine. They, they liked what, what, what was happening. So I wasn't sure if I'd even been there before, and I called the one uh, contact that I had, which was my cousin, uh, in, a, in a village called Okbop, and I said, listen, I've got to land, and I, here's where I think I am. And she said, she, she said, are you sure you're in the right spot? Because there's cannibals there. Thank you. <laughs> Click. So that really put my mind at ease. Well, the good thing was I jumped out flashing a, about a 75-tooth smile because uh, I couldn't speak the language. I speak Indonesian, but the dialects there are good for about a day's walk in any direction. So there was no way really to communicate with them other than body language. So it was like, man, am I happy to be here. This is the best. How'd you guys find this place? <laughs> the good news was when they turned out, it was the entire village. So it was men, women, and children. Uh, the rule there is if men, women, and children show up, you're okay. If it's only men, you're in trouble because they're expecting trouble. So that was fine. These guys actually gave me a, gave me a break. You know, they invited me in. We were just gesturing a lot and stuff. Um, I actually had a flask of Southern Comfort with me. I thought, should I share this? Maybe not. I don't want a drunk cannibal on my hands. <laughs> I don't want a sober one on my hands. Uh, so uh, we went. They were, they were kind enough. They, um, and these people were literally starving to death. And here's a tip. If you ever find yourself in a place where people are starving to death, if they offer you food, you take it. There's no looking at it and getting, you know, putting that face on and stuff like that. So anyhow, they offered me this stuff, um, Sago. It was sago root, which is kind of like a paste. And if it, some of you have been to Hawaii, maybe tried poi. It's kind of like poi. You know, it's pasty and sticky. And that was fine. But I looked inside the ball, and there were things moving around. Um, so I politely went about eating as much as I could. Um, and then we turned them to the night in these roundhouses. The way the roundhouses are laid out is um, there's, the fi there's the fire inside right in the middle. And it comes, you can probably see the smoke coming up through the top of that thing. There's fire, and then they have four posts, post sticks, um, with rattan strung about maybe 12 inches above the ground all the way around. The guys would come in, lay down, and put their feet on there, and that's how they slept. It was quite cold here. Uh, the women, I'm not sure what they did. The guys all stayed together. I got to stay in the guys' hut. You know, we played some beer pong and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> so it, it, was, it was pretty cool. Uh, but um, I, I was laying in there. A little tough falling asleep because I'm about a foot taller than all of them, so my feet were in the fire, literally. <laughs> I, I think I melted my tennis shoes on that one. And uh, more disturbing than that even was uh, I'm laying there during the night with people sleeping and I'm feeling stuff scampering across my chest. Rats, <laughs> which they were fine with because they eat them. I wasn't fine with it. Anyhow, got up in the morning and um, I was able at that point to call Jayapur and they flew another helicopter out with a barrel of drum or a, a drum full of fuel and I filled up and got to go where I was. But the upshot of that whole thing was um, because I ate the uh, sago root, I had a nice case of worms for about uh, a month after that. But that's how they lived, you know. Th these people live, they can die from a broken arm. They don't have any sort of medical help. You know, they, they're really not sure what they're doing. The only person that can give them any kind of assistance is a dukun, a witch doctor, 
and you can imagine how well that works. Um, and and the poor people, they're full of superstition and fear. So, and witch doctors, that's what they take advantage of. So, you know, their, their whole lives are just full of fear and it's sad really in a way. So these are the guys that showed up. Um, as you can see, they're, uh, they're decked out. Um, so some of the things you want to look for is the, uh, it's called the kateka, a penis gourd, but which we used to call pecker pipes. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, they're katekas, which uh, we called pecker pipes. They're called penis gourds. Um, that's an important part of the outfit. Uh, not a lot of warmth. And by the way, ladies, Christmas is coming up. So for that special someone, this could be the ticket. Pecker pipes are us. And being that they're for guys, they, the sizes start at large. I actually had a couple of them. One broke, and I think I wore the other one out. But uh, as you can see, uh, you know they they wore teeth around their uh, around their necks most of the time, and you'll see this further on. They wore they were wearing gauged ears long before millennials. You know, they had bamboo uh, about that big uh, in their ears. A lot of them wore nose buttons. They put thorns through the inside of their nose and wear usually some sort of button on the end of it. Um, oh, and the, <laughs> don't forget the bones through the nose. Well, as you can see, if these things look a little too geometrically perfect, somebody early on, one of the other missionaries said, gave one of the guys a Bic banana, the yellow Bics, you remember the Bic sticks? And the guy wore it in his nose. Well, he was the envy of the neighborhood. Well, so she took and sent a picture back to Bic. They sent her a case of these pens. <laughs> so these stupid pens are on people all, <laughs> all over New Guinea, sticking out of their nose. And they actually took it one step further, and I have a couple of pictures of it. Um, but so they learned to put, use Bic pens in their nose. Ever any batteries? in the ear, um, and some of them started wearing tin can lids when they figured out what tin can lids were on their nose. Made it a little difficult to see, trying to look over the top of one of those things. And the rest of the can they used, there's a picture, but uh, you'll see in a minute. Um, the people, they were very intimidating to look at. Um, and rightly so. They were warriors. They fought all the time. Uh, while I was there at one point, I, um, <laughs> I was asleep in my hut, which wasn't too far different from what they were doing. And um, next thing, and there's no glass anywhere, nothing, none of that stuff. And um, I woke up in the, in the morning with a lot of yelling and shouting and stuff. I woke up and looked up. I'm seeing, hearing, seeing spears and boat arrows and stuff going back like this. Well, it was basically the jets and the sharks, you know. There, the, the nearest village, there was a girl. That's how these troubles always start, right? <laughs> and uh, one of the guys got, uh, got a little feisty with the girl, and so these guys came over to settle scores. So they come over and shot at each other, and did all this stuff, and you know, there's a couple of broken bones and stuff. Nobody was killed, but then they all patted each other on the back. It's like a rugby match, I guess, what I imagine the aftermath of a rugby match is. Um, but uh, that just happened all the time. Further west, there was a tribe called the Donnies that were very warlike, and they didn't get away quite as easily as that. But because I couldn't speak the dialect, I got a Donny missionary. They were missionized long before these other guys. And uh, uh, if need be, I could bring this guy with me and he could speak the local dialect. So more of the same. This guy's really suited out with his uh, t-shirt. I should explain. 
Um, so it's cool here. Obviously, they have no clothes. They have uh, the guys wear the pecker pipes. The gals, I have a grass skirt over here that they wore, uh, which, by the way, afterwards, you're welcome to come up and check this stuff out. Um, but if you ever wondered what happened to all the stuff you donate to the missions, it goes over there. Um, they take it out to the missionaries. They take them out to these, you know, um, out, in the, out beyond the black stump places and stuff. And they try to clothe them. It's not natural to them, but they, they feel they do this at least to go to church on Sunday. They make them go to church on Sunday. Um, so, as in a typical warrior society or a hunter-gatherer society, the guys always get the first choice. Um, you'll see the effect of that in a minute. Uh, so the gals were usually left with ragged, raggedy old shirts and mucklocks or, uh, you know, bras they could wear on the outside of their T-shirt. Um, a lot of the guys chose dresses just because they were really fancy looking and uh, there weren't any crinolines, there weren't any, no ball gowns or anything like that, but uh, they always chose the brightest and the coolest looking stuff. Uh, this person is 16 years old. What? No, wrong. Kidding. I don't know how old she is. I mean, the, the people there do not get to live to be very old. Only the really strong survive. Uh, so, I mean, they die from anything before they get to that point. If you notice, the people that, that are alive are uh, pretty hale and hearty. Um, but this guy was just walking along, you know, doing her work and stuff. Oh, there are, so this guy is a dukun. He is a witch doctor. And uh, it was eerie. I, I could even tell. I looked into this guy's eyes, and I, it's like I was looking at the back of his brain. I mean, the pupils were so big. They, they smoked some stuff there. I'm not sure it's legal yet, but <laughs> it's legal here. Uh, but um, he was a scary character. But it, you can probably tell by, uh, well, just looking at this guy, their hygiene is probably not up to our standard. Uh, most of them are covered in soot from fires because they sit around fires every night. That's the only way they can stay warm. Uh, not much in the way of cleaning. Uh, not a lot of water. And an odd thing is that most of them have never seen themselves. The only way you can see yourself is if you look in standing water. There's no glass, no reflective anything. So when I would go out there, I, I came to that realization going out there and I'd take a Polaroid camera, which most of you probably call a motel camera, um, and I'd take pictures and they would sit there and look. I'd show it to them and they'd look and go, there's so-and-so, that, that, who's this though? It's like, that's you. They have never seen themselves. So when I would go to barter with them, <laughs> the first time I tried, if you see that thing over there, that shield, I got that and I got it from this guy, this warrior, and I said, I want to get that. Okay, so I went to give him some money. <laughs> he looked and it's like, what the hell's this? I'm giving you something of value. You give me a piece of paper? No. Not how it works. So I, I learned that you had to barter and, and to have something of actual intrinsic value. So when I used to go out after that, I used to carry tobacco, salt. Salt was big because they're so far inland, they get no iodine. Um, a lot of them have huge goiters and stuff like that. Steel, axe heads. Big seller, um, and but the best of all, mirrors. <laughs> so I would give them mirrors, and you can see they're not especially attractive people, but they would walk around all day like this, like teenagers with cell phones, <laughs> looking at themselves, you know, and with, with the afro comb and doing this thing. Um, that was a big 
that was a big deal. I mean, they really got to enjoy themselves with that. The two guys on the right were the German anthropologist I was talking about. Unfortunately, one of them, the guy on the right, was killed in an earthquake just after this. And the other guy on the far left was a pilot that I was relieving. Here's another big banana. Um, just a welcoming party. You know, they, they look like they just came from a Rotary Club luncheon. Uh, but they're, uh, you know, they're curious. They come out, they don't understand all these things spinning around on a helicopter. Uh, they called it a stone bird. And unfortunately, the young guys who had to try and prove themselves would go and try and run underneath the tail boom, not realizing the exhaust is there and there's a tail rotor right behind them. If I knock their head off, I'm dead. <laughs> it's payback. I mean, there's no questions asked. So it was always difficult to keep these guys in line. This actually was a church function, which seems kind of nice. You know, they introduced them to Christianity. Um, this is a regrettable shot on this photo, unfortunately, for that missionary. Uh, <laughs> That was unintended. <laughs> but you could see those that had clothes would, were required to wear them and stuff like that. And people would come and sit out there and hear the word and stuff like that. And it, and it was all with the best of intentions, you know. So you can't complain about that. You know, one thing about it is it helped them deal with their superstition and the darkness of their lives. Just to find something that was good that they could believe in. So... Bravo for them. Okay, so I talked about the uh, removing the uh, the can lid and wearing it on your nose. This is the other end of the can. So some of the, this is modern technology uh, at its worst. This I don't know, guys. Would you stick the old boy inside of a Coca Cola can like that? <laughs> It doesn't seem like the best idea, but, uh, but he, he was the pride of the village. <laughs> this gal just doing her job. I mean, you know, if you were 35 years old there, you were old. You were ancient. Um, you were probably a great-grandmother by that point, and that's probably about where this gal was. Uh, more interpretations of the pecker pipe. Um, th but they literally, before they had all the uh, the big pants and stuff like that, they wore bones in their noses and, you know, all the stuff. A lot of them painted themselves up. Um, they carried these daggers in their arms. You, if you see that armband he has, I have a couple daggers here that are, uh, you'll see, they're made out of cassowary bone, a cassowary bone thigh. A cassowary is a bird that's indigenous to there. If you stand next to it, you're looking into its eyes. I mean, they're that tall. They're huge. So the thigh bone is almost as big as a human thigh bone. So they would get those things, remove them, and make these daggers out of them. I have a couple of them over here you can take a look at. Anyhow, here's, <laughs> here's what happens when the guys get to pick what they're wearing. I'm not sure if it was the senior prom here or what, but but uh, you can see this guy looks very chic in that uh, in a sheath dress, and this other guy, if you look on the left hand side, he's got a suspicious bump under that uh, crinoline, uh, but he's pretty happy with it. Uh, there's another interpretation of the pecker pipe. I'm I'm not sure why you would choose that one. This guy's obviously a statesman. <laughs> Just like here, the bigger that thing is, the more important you think you are. <laughs> uh, 
And then this is uh, this is an all-purpose uh, carry-on. This is a local backpack, which again I have a couple of them up here. It carries everything from babies to you know firewood to uh, whatever you're lugging around from place to place. That's about five minutes in a helicopter was a day's walk for them. So they didn't get too far away. They stayed pretty close. If they lived in a valley, they usually never left the valley their whole lives. Um, there's himself uh, on a PR campaign. Um, that particular arrow, they had different arrows for different things, and I have a few of them. In fact, is I have that one. It's, it's like that. It's a fork. It's for birds so that they don't, you know, birds aren't that big, so they don't pierce them, but they would hit them and drop them. And there was some just made out of uh, roots for lizards. Their diet is not great, you know. They're hungry all the time. And, you know, the thing, the thing about cannibalism, and I, I'm not sure, I don't think these guys were, frankly. There are plenty of cannibals in New Guinea, uh, plenty of headhunters. Uh, also, but cannibalism is really a ritual thing. They don't eat because they're hungry. You know, they don't find some fat guy and say, "Throw him in the stew pot." You know, we'll feed the we'll feed the village for a month and stuff. It's it's more ritualized. If they're in a battle with somebody and someone's especially brave, they want to eat their heart if they kill them because they think they'll take on those same qualities. So it was for to gain courage, to gain wisdom. I was never worried about being there. <laughs> I was always afraid one of them would want to learn how to fly a helicopter, but apparently they didn't. Oh, these are the knives I'm talking about. These are the fact is I have these right here. Uh, these are made from cassowary thigh bones, and that. <laughs> That is local um, Kevlar. That's a Kevlar vest for them. They would wear them, and you can see how the size of the people. They are not very big at all. Uh, they're very small, but the weave on these things is so tight, it would stop an arrow because these arrows had no velocity to them. You had really had to be standing about 15 feet away from somebody to do any damage. Uh, otherwise, there's no, no feathers on them, no flight. And... You know, the bowstrings were bamboo, so, or rattan, rather. So it was kind of an insignificant weapon, but uh, it made them feel secure, I guess. Okay, well, ladies, you're not going to like this one. So you can tell the, the, uh, the gals, not all of them, but some of them had breasts of two dramatically different sizes. Uh, the reason being is that uh, pigs were very important to their livelihood. So uh, if you were of age uh, with children, one breast was for your child and the other one was for the pig. <laughs> I know. We've come a long way. What? Oh, that's a... That's a... Um, Bikini bottom. Yeah. This is how they grow things. They're not, the terrain is very unforgiving there. Um, the only thing they really can grow is um, sweet potatoes. And that was their version of cooking was they would take a sweet potato, throw it in a fire, in the fire, and then pull it out and eat it. They had, when I was taking food to them, I would pull out a 50 pound bag of rice and they go, well, this is fine, but what am I gonna eat? This is why I had to have a Donnie missionary with me and he would, we would take pans out and show them actually how to cook because they had no idea. It was just pull something out of the fire, eat it, you're done. And this is how they would grow them is in this, uh, and I'm no, I'm no farmer, but I guess they build these mounts and stuff like that and, they can grow tubers and stuff in them. Um, pretty tough life. 
uh, stone axe. That was their um, that was their Swiss Army knife, really. Uh, that was for everything from chopping wood to digging holes to to uh, settling scores. Um, that is me. This this is my Christmas card this year. Um, if you look, you can see some of the guys. Uh, you can see some of them have the Coca-Cola cans and stuff. The guy next on to my left with the shirt on, he was a Donnie. So he actually could speak with the people. We would go around, give them medicine, show them how to cook, bring food to them and stuff like that. And uh, he was well enough acquainted. He spoke Indonesian. He didn't speak any English. But really good guys. Um, and they were interested in helping people out, which is a big advantage. But that was the aircraft I flew around there, uh, called the US-500. Um, the reason for the framing on the picture is <laughs> I handed my camera, and it was there was no iPhones then. It wasn't trouble-free, so I had a 35-millimeter camera. And um, I handed it to one of the guys, one of the natives, and they saw me before like this, taking pictures. So they were taking them like this. <laughs> so I had them snap about 15 shots. And this is the only one that I appeared in. <laughs> um, OK. All right, folks, that's it. That is the presentation. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for yeah, Tom? Yeah, are there any questions? How long were you there, Tom? In this particular place, I was there about two months uh, through the course of the, of the earthquake. But I flew in Arian for a couple of years, probably. But way over on the western tip of it, it was called the bird's head of Arian Jaya. And there was, there was an old Japanese air strip right there, too. But, a lot of what was going on there, this is oil exploration. It's, you know, they tried to figure out how they could best, uh, you know, capitalize on, on their resources and stuff. And that's pretty much all that was there. We had to have fuel drums flown in. So it was pumping. Unless I could talk one of the guys into uh, siphoning it, which, which I did often until they realized they had to spit out the fuel. <laughs> yes? You know, I was wondering, like, that was 77. Uh-huh. Um, moving forward in time, you know, it's 40-some years later, do you happen to know, um, have they brought a lot of uh, Western culture into the area, or is it still, I wonder how, how primitive it is in today. Well, only because the place is so remote, I think, in these areas, it's probably still fairly primitive, just because there's nothing there and there's no reason to develop. Out on the coast, you find a lot more development, and it's a little more modern. Um, on the north coast, there were, you know, farms and stuff, and no industry to speak of. Down in the south coast, by the Sepik River, one of the guys that was here said he'd been there, back there, yeah. Um, it was down in that area that I think the tribe is Asmats. Yeah. That's where Michael Rockefeller disappeared. And the reason being, apparently, he was doing, I guess he was an amateur anthropologist. I'm not sure if he was full fledged, but he was studying headhunting. And in order to be able to get samples of headhunting, he was paying a bounty on heads, and all of a sudden, a lot more heads started disappearing. And the, the villagers said, uh, we know how to stop this. And so Michael disappeared. But that was back, that was before this, actually, yeah. But yeah, the coastal areas were much different. This is up in the mountains in a very different environment and very, very challenging. You know, those people, the, the mountains there are six to 8,000 feet, it's cold. Um, and that makes sort of for diff difficult flying too, you know, the higher up you are. 
uh, especially in the helicopter because you have to be able to hover. And sometimes I just crash into these pads just <laughs> because I couldn't fly. <laughs> okay, anybody else? All right, I welcome you to come up and check this stuff out. As uh, Mike suggested, um, there's some bows and arrows, some spears. I have a blowgun and, and some darts. I can't guarantee they're, that they're not poison, so just be careful with them. But please come up and avail yourself, and if you have any questions, I'll be over here. You can ask me. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>